Hello again. What we're looking at in this week's PowerPoint is universal design for learning. And through this topic, we'll be looking at what we do to help learners right from the start of our lesson planning process. So our road ahead is about universal design for learning. And notice it's got capital letters because this is a, a particular style of planning. When we think about what we're going to be doing in preparing for our students with all sorts of learning support needs, there are some things that are outside our control. This photo is from a South African township where um, I visited a group of families that were supporting each other to educate and provide early intervention for children with disabilities. We can't, can, we can't change poverty, we can't change all sorts of external contexts, but what we are able to offer is good teaching, and the right support. And this is a, a teacher that I worked with in the Kimberley, and she was faced with perhaps some more extensive external challenges than um, many other teachers might have. But she still was able to offer good teaching and the right support. So she had a class of um, children who were happy to come to school and were making a great deal of progress because she was planning well for them and really focusing in on their learning. When we're planning for diverse learners, we've got things to think about. So when we plan, we're thinking beforehand. During the lesson, we have to think about the process and the pedagogy. So we're thinking about what we're teaching it, how we're teaching it, and what the learners are engaging with. Then we've got the product, which is really the outcome. It might be undertaken during the lesson, but it's what is left behind after the lesson to be able to show what the student knows or can do. Now, when I say show, I don't necessarily mean a physical object. It could be that they've answered questions and you as the teacher is aware of their learning or you might have been watching them in their, their lessons so you might have been observing them painting a, a picture or completing a mathematics exercise so you're aware of what they can do so what we're thinking about now it's what we're doing around the planning for diverse learners that we're thinking about so get ready the students are coming but notice in the picture there aren't any there yet so I want you to imagine now planning for classrooms where you don't yet know who's going to be in there. So up front, you're going to try to meet as many learning support needs as you can, right from the start in the plan. This is an idea that's come from um, architecture. Now, if we look at this, building here, what we face here straight up are stairs. What's going to happen? How can a person access that building if they use a wheelchair or if they have a pram or if they have um, maybe even a, a walking frame? Now what we could do is after a building's built, we could retrofit. So we could put in something like what we see in this picture here where a person's accessing those stairs through a lift, a lift device, an expensive way to do it. Or we could design into the building right from the start this sort of idea where ramps are automatically included. This is an attractive set of stairs. We've got a similar one um, at Eagle uh, Pier, Eagle Street Pier in Brisbane, where you can ride a bike up those stairs, up the ramp, you could push a pram, you could um, use a wheelchair, or you could walk up the stairs. 
they're so right from the start they're an accessible feature so this is the idea of universal design in buildings has been translated into education so just like an architect might design a building that makes it accessible to as many people as possible that you don't have to then expensively change things when you have somebody with particular needs what we do in planning in classroom lessons is we imagine as many learning support needs as we can and we build it into the plan. So universal design for learning is about accommodating as many learners as possible. And one of the nice things about it is that it really does minimize how many adjustments you're going to need that are specific to a learner. But like a building design, while we might make those buildings as accessible as possible, there will always be some situations where extra attention is needed. For example, a friend of mine is a thalidomide survivor and she has no arms or legs. So her home is very extensively modified and her home, while I could live in her home, it has adjustments that aren't needed by me, but she would need. And they would be, um, uh, very particular for her extra needs. Going back to planning for lessons, universal design for learning is around the idea that we offer those supports, um, as many as we need and as many as we can think of, and we offer them to lots of other learners. A parent once told me that she went to her son's new primary school with a list of adjustments that he would need. He's a little boy with Down syndrome. So she knew that he would benefit from visual supports, movement breaks, using a calculator, having central processing support so that he um, had lists of things, so on, that, that those sorts of things would help him. But as she spoke with the teacher and visited the classroom, she put away her list because she saw that those things were already in place for all the students. If we then move on to UDL, and on the previous slide there was a hyperlink, so you can click on the hyperlink to an organisation that's developed this universal design for learning and that you can get an overview there. There are three main principles in the way they're thinking about this. Multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression, and multiple means of engagement. So we look at representation, provide options for perception, so how you get information. We learn a lot in our culture around language and symbols, and indeed that's a human way of learning very important aspect. So focusing on multiple means of use of language and symbols is really important. And then multiple means of options for comprehension. So how do we make sure that a student is able to comprehend the material that's being represented? The key thing here is the multiple means. So multiple means, um, I learned a new trick um, a year or two ago. I had a student who was deaf and I needed to provide captioned videos. So by Googling it, good old Google, I was able to find how I could do it and not require somebody to be paid to do it. Um, the university would have paid, but I couldn't guarantee that it would be done quickly. So to find out that it could be done automatically on YouTube was a great thing for me. But now that it's there, I know how to do it, I try to do it as a, just a routine part of practice. It takes a little bit extra time, but it is an important aspect of accessibility. Thinking about action in expression, we can think about physical action, expressive skills and fluency, and then options for executive functions. Now, executive functions are those aspects of the brain that are guiding the tasks that we do. 
So using our strategies for planning, for organising what we're going to do next, for retaining things in memory, those sorts of things that um, some students find particularly difficult, that we can support them through the learning process. And the third one is multiple means of engagement. How do we get students interested to start with? How do we sustain that effort and persistence? And then leading to that overarching goal of self-regulation. So they learn how to be involved and maintain their interest in the learning themselves. You can learn more about this at this cast.org. That's a US group that really came up with this idea of taking universal design in buildings and putting it into the learning context. So a short guide, universal access for teaching, for learning and then assessment. So think about how do we make our teaching accessible? What can the students do? What multiple means can we provide to help them with their learning? And then multiple means for assessment. We're going to talk more in coming weeks about year level curriculum, but this is right at the heart of it, that we take a, a curriculum instead of going back to where the learner might be considered to be, if they're in year eight, we teach them the year eight curriculum. And then we use principles of UDL, for example, to design that. And enabling prompts are ways of helping a student get involved in a lesson or a task, and then extending prompts, allowing them to continue that challenge. So as we mentioned before, some students will need more than what we will plan in a UDL lesson. So there will be some students who will have very particular support needs, and these are likely to be on an education inclusion plan or at university level, a student access plan. So if we go back to the building analogy, if we design our building so that it's accessible for most people coming in, you haven't got to uh, worry about um, stairs because we've provided ramps or we've got escalators or lifts. We, if we've got those automatically in buildings, a lot of people will be able to access them. However, there will be some additional requirements that are needed for some people. So for a person who doesn't have arms or legs, they are likely to need very particular designs that we will add in. So in a classroom, these things may be necessary. However, what teachers typically do is then provide those for everybody. So if you are providing particular aspects, um, these can be then used by other students if necessary. So a captioned video might be useful for a student who is deaf, but it also might be useful for somebody who wants to look at the video when they can't have the sound on. So these things then can be useful for other people. So Pope makes a very important point. UDL is not an adjustment. UDL is about good design and it minimises the need for adjustments. So if you design features into your lesson, you haven't got to then add them in afterwards. But it's not to say that you'll be able to get rid of the need for adjustments altogether. So getting ready, the students are coming. What do we do ahead of time? Well, we think UDL. We think about putting in as much in the lesson plan to start with. An example again might be something like if we have a worksheet, we have an electronic copy of that. So a student might be able to use it as on paper that we print out and hand out. But if they need it printed in a particular font size, like extra large font, or they need it printed on a particular color paper, 
they can do that themselves so they can adjust it to a format that suits them. We also then need to be ready to action individual education or curriculum plans. So if a learner has particular support needs, we then put them into place as well. So what have we been thinking about? In this particular um, PowerPoint, we've been talking about an introduction to universal design for learning. In coming weeks, we'll be looking at specific interventions for differentiation. So we'll then be looking at learning adjustments. So I want you to think about what was interesting and what was challenging and what will you think more about. And on the learning support materials Blackboard, you'll be able to find out um, some more references, some more things to think about and some more readings to take your thinking further.